Just a warning, this video contains a lot of facts, but a healthy dose of personal opinion as well, so don't take it hard if you don't agree. Hello again, Alex here, and as usual, sorry about the background noise, they're doing construction right out on my corner, but I just can't delay putting out these videos any longer, so deal with it. Maybe I'll drop some music in the background of this video to kind of drown it out. Now this one is not directly related to what we're working on, but it is indirectly related to a whole bunch of things that are going to be going on. So this video is what is Linux, and it's going to be kind of a, a basic video for people who have everybody's heard the term Linux. We know that it's the mutant free operating system that's floating around out there. But I wanted to explain some of the fundamentals to people and maybe encourage them to give it a try. And my interest in having them give it a try is not for like desktop computing and, you know, your email and, you know, checking social media and that sort of thing, surfing the internet. I don't do any of that stuff on Linux, even though I use it literally every day. Although you can do all those things. I'm more interested in the scientific tools and all of the free software that's available as that relates to some of the nerdier ventures that we're going to be doing on this channel, and we have done on this channel, and things that are going to be coming up. What's the most important to me about this is that if something is free, has community support, and is accessible, more people are likely to try it. We've seen that with, like, um, Autodesk's 123D suite and Fusion 360, where a lot of folks who never would have touched CAD see these people doing it on video, say, oh, that's free and I can grab it right now, pull in some models and like tinker around with it. And then all of a sudden, before they know it, they're making objects in CAD. Now, five, 10 years ago, that would have been mind blowing because CAD packages, those of you who know, have worked with like, you know, Autodesk and that sort of thing, they cost thousands of dollars. Same thing with like MATLAB or any of those other scientific tools, like thousands of dollars. So the more eyeballs we have on this, the more likely we are to get people that are stumbling onto something that's going to help either themselves in their life direction or help the community in general. The more creative people you get with tools in their hands, the more likely we are to get cool stuff. And that makes us all happy. Anyway, all right, Linux. It's... Here's a term that you are going to want to get familiar with, F-O-S-S, Free Open Source Software. And that's basically at the heart of Linux. It's FOSS Operating System, or OS, as I'm going to call it for the rest of this, for, you know, brevity's sake. If you're not into the whole brevity thing. The type of operating system it is, is what's known as a Unix-like OS. So that's like, um, well, Unix, BSD, uh, Mac OS, AIX, iOS, Solaris, etc., etc., etc. And let me throw a little bit of common terminology in there. There's the Linux kernel, that's the most basic and central part of the operating system. And the kernel is where Linux gets its name. Linux was created by a guy named uh, Linus Torvalds back in the early 90s. And then it got a kind of a GUI interface a couple years later in the, in the early to mid 90s. Now, there are many, many different flavors of Linux, and those flavors are called distributions or distros. Examples would be um, Ubuntu, Debian, Mint, Arch, Nopix, Raspbian, Android, all those kinds of things. They'll roll a distro for a particular use, like you might have one that's specifically just a live CD that you know just runs off a DVD, loads the whole thing into RAM, and it's done for a very specific purpose, like maybe a system recovery, or maybe like audio production or just scientific tools or something like that. Because you can do something like take the kernel and in, have uh, you know an operating system that's or, or a distro that's centered around a kernel that's specifically for like uh, symmetrical multiprocessing or one that's meant for low latency real time computations. And since one of the joys of Linux is all of the anybody can program anything for it, put it up on the internet and have anyone install it for free and use it, all those little bits of software, they're not called like applications or apps or anything like that. They're usually um, organized into what's called packages. And the center for that is your package manager. Basically the analogy would be like an app store or a Windows store, but free and organized in a less stupid manner so you can actually search for things. 
the package manager is it's different on a couple different distributions. The most common ones are like apt for uh, Debian Linux type of uh, derivative distributions or yum or something similar. And that speaks to the core of why I'm making this video, because just in Debian alone, they have over 50,000 different packages that you can choose from and install totally free. Most of them are, I think with Debian, all of them are, are open source or GPL or at least open source. And you can download them. If they don't do what you like, you can change them. You can also easily write your own programs for it. I make a ton of little helper programs for myself, like this silly program that just turns a movie into ASCII. And this one that spits out filter coefficients for like a Butterworth to put into like a Biquad. It's nerdy audio stuff. One of the other positive things about Linux is it's available for a whole bunch of different platforms. AMD, x86, ARM, just about anything that's out there. You can find a distribution that'll run on it. And the terminal is something that you're probably not going to be used to if you're coming from a Windows world. If you're coming from the Mac world, you may have spent a little bit of time in the terminal. But that's your command line interface where you can get easily to the nuts and the bolts of the thing. Which leads me to this section that I have to put in where here's some of the things that are going to be weird working in Linux if you're used to just the regular desktop computing world. I mentioned the terminal. You're going to spend a lot of time in there. So get used to the idea. Also, it's nerdtastic. So if you're used to just like going through a start menu and like finding an application and double clicking on it and then scrolling down through menus and pushing buttons to get it to do things, a lot of the very useful programs don't have a GUI interface. It's like the equivalent of working in DOS, if you remember those days. So you get into like a really fiddly state. So you're going to run into situations where you're like, I wish there were an application that just did X, Y, Z, go on a forum, and they're going to say, all you have to do is go to the terminal and type in these 800 case sensitive commands. And that's just daily life for them, but it might seem a little bit weird to the new user, which leads me to another part of it. The workflow and user friendliness is definitely not on par with something like a mainstream operating system. I think it's a little bit easier since you can customize it. It's a little bit easier than a lot of the modern Windows, particularly like Windows 8 and anything with the dumb Metro interface. But it's not as easy as like running through a start bar, although you can put a start bar down there if you like navigating that way. But the folder structure is a little bit wonky to get used to. And it's not nearly as usable and workflow friendly as like a Mac OS if you're used to that. Also, particularly if you're coming from the Windows world, you're going to find that the security may seem a little bit over the top. So pick a password that's easy to type because you're going to be typing it in a lot. Many times if you want to make any sort of important change, you have to sudo into it, super user into it, and then put your passcode in before it'll let you do anything. Drivers are a little bit wonkier to take care of. Most things, some nerd out there will have gotten it up and running. Although every once in a while you might get like a doohickey or a thingamajig on your computer that doesn't quite work like, right, like a fingerprint reader or some wacky feature of like backlighting or your trackpad or something like that. And just like anything, you're still going to run into tribalism and elitists on the forums. That's really true of anything though, so just ignore them. But finally, let's talk about the software. So one of the things about it is it's not going to run Call of Duty at elite FPS or anything like that. But I'm not concerned in the context of this video with regular desktop replacement. I'm concerned with the free tools that are available for doing the nerdy science stuff. Specifically, in some videos, I'm going to be referring to the GCC ARM compiler toolchain, which is what you're going to be using to work with software that goes on embedded microprocessors like we use in 3D printers and other such DIY tools. Now, there are plenty of cross-platform tools, like if you're used to using VS Code or Eclipse to code in, you can get that to work on Windows, Mac, and Linux natively. They all, they work fine. And for some of the other basic tools that don't have a cross-platform version, there's always the Wine emulator, which stands for Wine is not an emulator, it's kind of an emulator, that lets you run some Windows programs on Linux quasi-natively. And I use that all the time for like a Fem Magnetics program, a Circuit Maker, a various, like if I download some sort of like, hey, this is a 
program that some guy at Berkeley made to compute some wacky thing, like that'll usually run in Wine if they if they made it for Windows. Usually those people are working in Linux though. Um, PCB layout programs like Eagle you can get to work. And then you also have options like, you know, KiCad and Fritzing that are cross-platform. And then you have some things that are very expensive like MATLAB, which has several alternatives that are completely free in Linux, like uh, Scilab and GNU Octave. And those are the types of programs like you might not have known you ever needed it until you start using it. If you're doing a lot of like complicated math. Very early on in the 90s, I found out it was important to learn how to teach a computer to do the math for you. So now you might be thinking like, well, that's great, but I've, what, would I, what would I use that for? We have a very kind of desktop computing centric view of things, but despite that, Linux is the most popular operating system in the world. Now, obviously not desktop computing. When you're talking about desktops, 82% of all users are on some kind of Windows. 13% are on Mac, and only 1.5% to 2%-ish are on Linux. But two main factors here. Desktop computing only represents a very small segment of the market. Linux rules the roost in areas like uh, servers, public cloud, compute, like pure compute machines e-readers, smart TVs, cars, drones, raspberry pies, and all your Android gizmos. And over the years lately, in the last decade or so, you can see this trend where desktop computing is going down and mobile computing, embedded computing, and all other types are going up. And as like Internet of Things is becoming more of a, well, thing, and more of us using mobile ARM platforms, it becomes much more popular. Plus, since Linux is free, modular, and there are plenty of open libraries out there, it's very attractive for startups who are making small gizmos to use Linux to drastically cut down their costs and not get stuck in a support cycle with somebody like Microsoft. But imagine if they had broken into that market and every time you had to update to a, you know, a large operating system version on your phone or your router or something like that, you had to pay a Windows upgrade fee. That would be weird. So obviously a lot of people are used to every few years giving Microsoft 100, 200 bucks or so, whereas in the, uh, for the desktop market, whereas in the kind of mobile market, we just assume those sort of things are free these days. So my recommendation, if you're looking to dip your toes into this, are start off with a Debian derivative distribution and go with something that's user-friendly like Ubuntu or Lubuntu or Kubuntu or one of those versions, whichever your hardware can handle. And then if you use that for a little while and you think that's cool, but you kind of want to dip your toes into other things, there's a website called DistroWatch. Head over there and you can look at hundreds of different distributions and see if one tickles your fancy. So if you're not happy with either vanilla Debian or Ubuntu derivative, then you could try Mint Linux or Fedora or Arch Linux. Now, most of these, in particular Ubuntu, have um, live DVDs that you can just download the image, burn it directly to a DVD, and boot right off of that. It'll take a little while to start up. It'll take a lot while to start up because DVDs are slow AF. But you can also put it on a USB stick, sometimes depending on your computer, and you can load directly from the DVD or the USB stick the entire operating system into RAM, and then it works very quickly. And that'll let you try it out, and you can even install from there if you want. I personally think the easiest way to do it is just grab a small SSD drive, like a laptop drive that you can plug into your machine, and use that, just install Linux on that, and forget about it. But you can partition your current drives and dual boot or triple boot or quadruple boot or whatever. I'm gonna wait for that beeping to stop. Oh, the beeping. Oh, the beeping. We know you're backing up. My sort of workhorse machine for dealing with um, microprocessor programming and that sort of thing is an ancient MacBook that I have right over here. And that triple boots uh, Windows 7, Mac OS, and 
some flavor of Linux. I think it's Ubuntu right now. Usually I use like stock Debian. One of the nice things about Ubuntu is that it pulls in non-free libraries, like non-open source libraries that don't meet uh, Debian's kind of strict specifications naturally. Whereas in Debian, you have to go and individually add those and allow them. But you can get a cheap like SSD drive for under 30 bucks nowadays and dedicate it just to Linux. Or you could just buy a laptop off of eBay. When I said my workhorse is a MacBook, some of you probably went, oh, Apple expensive. I paid 20 bucks for it. And I've been using it for three years. We've been convinced because of consumerism that we need the latest and greatest and super fastest. And for this type of stuff, not really. Like I said, we're not trying to run Call of Duty at like 120 frames a second on 144 Hertz monitor. We're just running basic command line modules that run in very, very little RAM. So anyway, thanks for sticking around through this video. I'll get more practical stuff out soon. If you have any questions about this stuff, leave them in the comments below. I try to check a couple times a week and get back to people if I can, unless it's a really involved answer, then I'll usually let it ride until like the Q and A video so I can talk about it for a few minutes instead of trying to type in a stupid comment window. And until the next video gets out, Get out there and make something awesome. Get out there and make something awesome with some free software. See ya.